Hey everybody, so today I want to talk about Buddhism after Buddha. And really the problem comes up in every religion, right? In every spiritual tradition. The leader dies and the students, the followers have to kind of look around and decide what are we going to do? How do we keep these teachings alive? How do we keep the practices going? And so I think with all of the best intentions, things start getting written down and institutions are formed and scriptures are created and authority rises and dissent tears it all apart. You can trace these same dynamics after Muhammad died in Islam. When Jesus died in Christianity, the disciples scattered and people tried to figure out what the next steps were. No different here. When the Buddha died, after 45 years of teaching, his students looked around and said, let's keep it going. And the written record's pretty scant, but we have some sense that a group of monks kept the practices going. And that earliest group is called Theravada. Theravada meaning the way of the elders. And then after another century or two, another group sprang out of that called Mahayana, Mahayana for great vehicle or great raft. So before we get into the details about those two early major schools, I want to touch back on a really powerful image that the Buddha left for us. Let's call it the image of the raft. He wanted his students to think about his teachings, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, all the practices as a means to an end as a vehicle designed to convey you from here to there. So when you are on a journey, he said, and you come upon a wide river, you build a raft and you use that raft to get across to the other shore. And when you get to the other shore, you don't lift this heavy waterlogged raft on your back and drag it into the jungle. You leave it at the river. So too, he's suggesting with this analogy, that the doctrines and the teachings and the practices of Buddhism are medicine for the sickness of dukkha, of suffering. And when one is healed, one does not need the medicine anymore. It's a remarkable way of framing a spiritual teacher's work because normally we don't get that message at all. We get the opposite message from a lot of spiritual traditions. These are the teachings, cling to them for life. Never vary, never waver, be loyal. But here we have a teacher saying quite the opposite, that these are techniques for transformation. And when transformation is realized, that's that. In fact, there's a great Zen Buddhist story about this. There's always a great Zen Buddhist story. It's called The uh, Two Monks and the Geisha. So there were these two monks from one Zen monastery traveling to another far off monastery, an old monk and a young monk. And they were traveling and they were walking and they came upon a very busy swollen stream. And it was the rainy season and it was gonna be hard to get across. It was gonna, the water was gonna come up to about here. And right before they were about to cross, they looked upstream and there was a beautiful geisha, a courtesan, think medieval Japan, Beautiful silk kimono, perfect hair and makeup, big platform shoes, not exactly geared up for a hike. And she was trying to get across this stream too. And the old monk went up to her, bowed, lifted her up and carried her across the stream and put her on the other side. She was very grateful. She went on her way. The young monk was mortified, but he kept his mouth shut out of respect. And eight hours later, now it's late at night and they finally arrive at this far off monastery and the young monk could contain his confusion and anger no longer. He said to the old monk, we are monks. We don't touch women. What are you doing? We took vows. Why would you throw decades of monastic practice away on that one indiscretion? Blah, 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 blah. He went on and on. He was getting so excited. And the old monk listened. And when the young monk kind of just ran out of words, the old monk said simply, I put her down at the river 
Why are you still carrying her? A story about attachment, not to things, but to doctrines, to ideas. That young monk wasn't wrong about the monastic rules of chastity and so on and abstinence. But he, he through his eyes, he misread that situation entirely. He misread it as some sort of erotic encounter. In other words, the monk knew all of the, the young monk knew all of the rules, but lost the point entirely. The purpose of religious practice is the cultivation of compassion and service. Look at how powerful that story is. Buddha is suggesting that if we adhere too tightly, too fundamentally to religious teachings and doctrines, we become a monster. We become at best indifferent, at worst cruel. The dangers of attachment are emphasized throughout Buddhist philosophy, and that story really brings it into focus. So let's think about how the two early movements of Buddhism, Theravada and Mahayana, navigated those issues, those questions. What do we do with the teachings of the teacher when the teacher is gone? So here's how they did it in the earliest iteration, in the earliest movement, Theravada, the way of the elders. These were the devotees of Buddha, the monks of Buddha. And they knew that Buddha did not want to be worshipped. They did not worship Buddha. They did not deify Buddha. They emulated his practices and behaviors. Buddha did it by himself. So they knew that they had to do it by themselves, through self-effort, through meditation. All that Raja Yoga stuff we talked about in Hinduism. So that tends to be the emphasis in Theravada Buddhism. The emphasis is on, you know, professionals, on monks and nuns who meditate and, and get themselves across the river in their own little boat. <laughs> in fact, the other school... Mahayana Buddhism is going to call these guys Hinayana, meaning small raft, because it's everybody in their own boat getting across the river. So that's how Theravada unfolds. It's more conservative. It's more self-reliant. And the, that, of course, is too arduous a path for ordinary people like us who have mortgages and families and are raising kids and have jobs and own businesses. We can't meditate all day. So a new form of Buddhism called Mahayana emerged out of Theravada a couple hundred years after the Buddha died. Mahayana meaning, again, great Maha, great, and Yana meaning vehicle or raft. And Mahayana Buddhism is the Buddhism for the rest of us. It's much bigger than the Theravada branch. And all of the later Buddhisms that will come along, like Tibetan Buddhism, like Zen Buddhism, come out of the Mahayana branch. So what are the key features of Mahayana Buddhism? Here, Buddha quickly becomes seen as a kind of celestial being who assists us in our efforts toward enlightenment. And almost a kind of bhakti or devotional energy begins to merge quite quickly. The idea that we don't have to do it on our own, that there is a Buddha who will help us. And here the phrase bodhisattva again comes into view. You remember that from earlier. Bodhi, illumined, and sattva, being. A bodhisattva is an illumined being. Buddha is a bodhisattva. And in Mahayana Buddhism, there are scores and scores of these bodhisattvas, almost like Catholic saints, formerly living human beings who now e exist in a kind of celestial sphere, who assist us in our efforts. Hence the name Mahayana. There's a big vehicle, there's a big raft. We all get in and a bodhisattva or a Buddha is gonna help us across the river. So that raft river analogy stays with us throughout. The other features of Mahayana Buddhism that we can touch on briefly are the way that the concept of enlightenment begins to shift. You know, in Theravada Buddhism, you had to kind of 
bear, you know, let's, let's put it this way. Enlightenment is in the mountaintop and you're down here. And through years of discipline, yoga and meditation, you might get there on your own. But in Mahayana Buddhism, there is this idea that Buddha consciousness, Buddha mind, Dharmakaya, um, is imbued throughout all reality. It's, it's, it's what this is. It's almost kind of an, it's almost kind of a Brahman Atman idea. So Dharmakaya or Buddha consciousness animates all reality, including us. In other words, you and I are already right now Buddhas, only we don't know it. And so the process of enlightenment is simply removing all the hindrances and obstacles that prevent us from realizing our Buddha nature. I know it's reminding me too of, of, of the whole Vedanta Hindu work we did before that I am, we are Brahmanatman, only we don't know it because of Maya and we are to realize our essential nature. So the parallels between Hinduism and Buddhism remain strong, but as Buddhism evolves, the Theravada branch and the Mahayana branch emerge and carry Buddhism right up to the present day. And um, the fact of the matter is, and I'll just wrap it up here, is that today most Buddhism is not only Mahayana Buddhism, but devotional Buddhism. Buddha, I think the Buddhist tradition largely faded out in India. And where it shines like the sun today, where it is dominant today is in East Asia, China, Taiwan, Vietnam, Korea, Japan, etc., Thai, Thailand, of course, and, and all the rest. That's where all the Buddhists really are, as well as being scattered around the world. That's where the Buddhist centers are. That's where most Buddhists are. And most Buddhism in East Asia is devotional Buddhism. Nishiren Buddhism, Pure Land Buddhism. And here, it looks on the surface like a kind of Christianity. There's this idea that if we devote our life to the Buddha, if we chant the Buddha's name, if we love the Buddha, then the Buddha will help us reach the pure land of Nirvana in the afterlife. So Buddhism is just another wonderful example on our journey through the world's religions in this class, where we see the human spirit, the human intellect, and, 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 and human curiosity lead itself toward increasing wisdom and illumination down all of these different paths. So that's where we're going to leave our study of Buddhism in our new online class. See you on the other side. See you next time. And I appreciate all of you working with us through this new process.